Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Thursday, March 28th. Happy opening day. It is the real opening day. Yes, yeah. thumbs up. Get the thumbs up right away. We're, we're off to yeah. the start. <laughs> All 30 teams were supposed to be in action today. We learned on Wednesday that a couple of games were going to be postponed to Friday because of weather. So no Brewers Mets, no Phillies Braves, at least for today. So hopefully we'll see more teams in action on Friday as a result. But anyway, we made it barely after dozens of drafts combined between the two of us and live shows and uh, team previews and position previews like it's here. It finally begins. I know new data. <laughs> Just new talking numbers. about the same numbers for like months. <laughs> it's uh, no, no. I like good. baseball. It's just not about numbers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's just yes, we've been pouring well, over. We've the been same immersed in baseball for six months. <laughs> you know, in fact, right now my I'm pretty sure my UCL hurts uh, from two things: uh, throwing batting practice a lot, and two, uh, holding my phone to look at baseball type stuff and Twitter type stuff while at baseball games. <laughs> yeah. So. You should use your non-throwing arm for that, given the extra strain on your throwing arm. I know, but then, then I don't think my thumb is as dexterous on that side or something. No, and the I phones now are so big. Like, I don't, you know. Get, get one pictures. of those Velcro straps. Just strap the phone <laughs> to your other hand if your hand can't handle it. That'll look good. You're in dad mode anyway. So. I mean, yeah, that's right. What I care about looking good. <laughs> I've given up completely. Like, you're gonna you're gonna see decay in me that you never thought this was like, possible. Like a little like a left forearm strap for my phone that just holds it there, so I can like you know. <laughs> yeah, and if you drop it, it just dangles down next to your elbow, but it doesn't fall and break on the ground. It seems like a pretty good little invention. Oh my god. I mean, hey, I never thought that fanny packs would come back. So <laughs> I thought, oh. you know, growing up, fanny packs were like, that is the dorkiest thing I've ever seen. Are they back? I mean, a lot of 90s stuff came back, so that makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> well, my wife is wearing them again, at least. <laughs> well, they're very practical if you have to hold a lot of things and don't want something, you know, over your arm or on your back. So or tons of stuff in your pockets. Yeah. Yeah, that too. Unless you want to wear cargo. See, cargo is going to come. Uh, out. The fanny packs will come out. <laughs> and all your cargo pants and cargo uh, shorts yeah, are going to follow. Cargo and strap my phone to my wrist. Here we go. <laughs> Best thing about living the cycle once is that you know what's coming the second time around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I bought one of those uh, when I was choosing my Indochine shirt. And I had an Indochino. 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 When I, had, when I was choosing my shirt, I was like, flannel. You're so back I got in the grunge a, phase. I got it, but it's fitted now. Yeah. Because I'm I'm an adult. Right. It's not the size of a tent. It's not the, the flannels I used to have. <laughs> right. Well, I still have one of those. Literally. Right. Well, from seventh grade. Nice job. Glad you made it all the way from seventh. That's a it's a long shelf life for a shirt. Uh that shirt will have been with you longer than Will Smith will be with the Dodgers, even with Will Smith signing a 10-year, $140 million extension. Uh, the numbers seemed a little weird. Like, the number of years seemed a little long. The number of dollars seemed... million dollar signing bonus. Like, a little low, but it's all, it's all kind of just part of the Dodgers' unique financial structuring of all these deals. It keeps the, an, the average annual value down, which has luxury tax implications, uh, Presumably, it keeps Will Smith in Dodger blue for the rest of his career. They could potentially trade him at some point, I guess. That's always a possibility. But it's interesting because I think we we like him as maybe the best hitting catcher in the game right now. There are plenty of other contenders. And I wonder how well he's going to age. He's 29 years old today. So happy 29th birthday to Will Smith, who's never heard of Rates and Barrels and will probably never <laughs> listen to it. But he looks like a player whose profile will age really well. It's sort of a question of what will they do with him defensively over a contract that long? Because we rarely see deals this long anyway, and we I don't think we ever see them for catchers. And you begin the deal this way, but where do you play after year five or year six when presumably someone much younger will be the starting catcher and maybe he's a part-time catcher and a part-time something else? I mean, I think he has the bat to do it. I mean, that's the fun part about him is that he's such a great defensive catcher, but 
you know, with uh, yearly 10% barrel rates and, you know, 16 to 18% strikeout rates and 11% walk rates, like that would be a good DH, you know, it might be a, a little bit less power than other DHs. Uh, but if you, if you could play first, which I think he probably, he could probably hit that bump along the way. Um, then I think he's got a lot of places he can play. One of the things that's, also kind of uh, amazing about this is that um, the uh, some of it's deferred. So what is the deal? Uh, I think, let me see here. There's a great Ken Rosenthal story about this where Teoscar Hernandez had deferred money. And of course, we know all about uh, Shohei Otani's deferred money. Um, but there's deferred money also, uh, $172 million of deferred money in Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman's deals. Um, and what I had, there was this, this great number in here in this piece, $870 million in deferred money. And I think this piece came out before <laughs> the Will Smith one where he's deferring like 5 million a year, uh, for a few years. So, I mean, you're talking about almost $900 million in deferred money that they'll owe from 2028 to 2040. <coughs> Are they just going to sell the team? Right. In like 2027 before they have to start paying the deferrals. <laughs> yeah. Like, like what well, we're seeing a little bit of the, uh, the chickens coming home to roost in Washington. I feel like, yeah, you know, cause they did the same, same thing where they just hit a bunch of deferred money. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to do it. Uh, the, one person pointed out that they are owned by an investment group. And so the idea that money has present value and, and, and future value, and those are different. Um, I think maybe the idea is that they think they can beat the market, right? And like use the money they have now to like make more money to pay those people later. Yeah. I wonder what happens if they're wrong. <laughs> we don't have to right. do that right now, but what, <laughs> what if it collapses? What if they're wrong? I mean, what if the Sotani story goes in a certain direction? Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of what ifs. Uh, maybe for a different day, but um, <laughs> yeah. no. But I think Will Smith is worth this, uh, and, and I think that uh, extending him to thirty eight also helps him with the with the CBT and, and keeps that number down. And um, I think this is, I would say, this is team friendly. Yeah, and I think the other way to look at it too is he's now signed, I think, for the same number of years as Otani. If Otani is not going to play the field. And he remains mm. mostly a DH that whole time. Then Will Smith would have to play first base or somewhere else defensively if he's not going to remain a catcher because you have those two guys locked up for a very long time. Uh, eventually, Freddie Freeman won't be a Dodger <laughs> right. after 2027. So we're still four years away from that point. But other news to get to some good news. Jordan Romano may only need a minimum stint on the IL. Things have been tracking this way since there was no structural damage detected uh, when he had further testing done on his elbow. Uh, so if you're trying to invest in the Blue Jays bullpen in the short term, that's exactly what it is. It's probably just a, a week or two of trying to find saves as opposed to a month plus, which some people may have thought they were doing drafting over the last week or so. Yeah, Jimmy Garcia might still be an interesting pickup uh, long-term for saves and holds because Eric Swanson is out. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I like Chad Green there to possibly be the setup man as well. So I think they can hold for it for two weeks and they'll be all right um, You know, in terms of thinking about the Blue Jays as a whole. And then in terms of playing, uh, if you took Romano, just don't drop him, I think. just Just hold for a little bit. At least yeah, get some more news. Pretty easy hold at this point, given it's a, a shorter timetable for his absence. Uh, a more difficult player to think about in redraft leagues is Jordan Lawler. He's going to miss eight to ten weeks following thumb surgery. He had a torn ligament in his thumb, suffered during a spring game. It's bad news because you're talking about half a season potentially that's lost, it, depending on how long it takes him to get through the final stages of the rehab. So we may not see him in Arizona until the second half. Needs on the roster will also determine you know, when exactly he shows up as well. Uh, but if we're in a typical you know, mixed league redraft situation with small benches or normal size benches, I don't think you want to try and hold Lawler all the way back to his eventual return, even though I think once we do see him this year, he can be an impact player for us. Do I have to jump? 
Yeah, one weird thing that happened, though, was that he was sent to the minor league camp before Blaze Alexander. Hmm. And Blaze Alexander is a 24-year-old shortstop that stuck with the major league team, major league team longer and had an excellent spring, just a really flat-out excellent. The batter ball stats we do have, you know, it was like a 60% hard hit rate or something. Uh, shout out to the reader that, that pointed this out. I immediately uh, went and picked up Blaze Alexander, dropping Josh Palacios um, in one of my deeper keeper leagues, just because this opens a little bit of a window for Blaze, who is, you know, at 24, has got no, no reason to be in the minor leagues anymore um, and may just use this window of opportunity. That said, the projections for, for Blaze are pretty, uh, pretty boring. And um, it has a lot to do with his strikeout rate. He did he did more of an aggressive uh, approach this spring, where he didn't walk much, but he also didn't strike out as much. Uh, in the past, he's been ultra passive and has struck out a lot. So if that if he did toggle that switch, and it's a good one for him, um, that would be it could be an interesting new blaze. Uh, and in for these next eight to ten weeks, he may be the backup uh, for Perdomo. Yeah, yeah, I think the results as he's moved through the minors have become a bit more interesting, a little bit like old for the level, but not like way old for the level. 23 at double A and 22, uh, 24 years old, of course, last year at triple A. It's only 73 games, but showed kind of double digit home run power. This spring, he was among the players running a lot more five for six as a base dealer. So really active on the base pass in addition to the adjusted approach at the plate. Probably an up and down guy, but for deep leagues, especially someone that could get more of an opportunity right, as a result of Lawler's two injury to, to, to showcase himself at the major league level, probably. Yep, might garner some interest from other clubs if he's not part of the long term plan in Arizona. Uh, an obligatory update that I saw scroll by: Wander Franco placed on administrative leave through June first, so I expect that to be extended at some point between now and then. And I think we've talked about it a few times. Just. Given the circumstances, I don't think we're going to see Wander like Franco play shot. ever again. Like it's just, yeah, it's done, it's over. Uh, but that's what they did on opening day, placed them on administrative leave. Other odds and ends. Tell me if any of these things matter for deep leagues or otherwise. John Birdie is a Yankee now. Mm. It's weird. Is that like cost saving for the Marlins? Because uh, he was to the Marlins kind of with DJ LeMay, who's for the Yankees. And the Yankees were like, well, we lost each of the Mayhew, so let's just pick up Birdie. Mm. You know what I think it really was for the Marlins? I think it was wanting to keep some of the younger players. Ah, uh-huh. uh, yes. Uh, Bruhan and Jonah Xavier. Bride still on the depth chart. Like they had a few infielders that they decided they wanted. And they traded for Nick Gordon a few they weeks back. They wanted to keep Gordon on the roster, yeah. It was probably yeah. the roster spot they wanted, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what it came down to. I mean, Birdie AL only leagues, really, really deep mixed leagues as a streamer, I think would be the the primary use case. And, and LeMahieu being out does create an opportunity. You know, Oswaldo Cabrera can play a little bit of third base. Oswald Peraza is hurt right now. So I think that's part of why they wanted to go out and get another infielder that they could throw out there on a semi regular basis. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I think it's a little bit, the, the Yankees offseason is weird. You know, Jordan Montgomery's just sitting there the whole time. And, you know, and they're like, oh, DJ LeMay was hurt. John Birdie. Uh, okay. I mean, they added Juan Soto yeah. and Alex Verdugo and Trent Grisham, which gave them a completely rebuilt outfield. Like that, that alone, I feel like was a pretty good offseason. Plus, they added Stroman. I gave him a bold prediction of, uh, of a top five offense. Yeah, Maybe I, I could see three. that. Healthy Rizzo, Torres in his walk year, Verdugo in that park, add Soto, step forward from Volpe, Judge being they also, Judge. They also were fourth in barrel rate last year and like 25th in runs. That's not usual. That does not usually happen. That is pretty surprising. I would say there is irrational pessimism around the Yankees right now. That's a good team that deserves to be viewed in a more more optimistic Red light. Sox, too. It's pretty amazing. I made a bold prediction about the Red Sox rotation being top five in the American League East, and that's not... I mean, not in the American League East, in the American League. And that's... <laughs> yeah, American League East, that would not be a very uh, a bold prediction. Although, bold. it's a tough... For, it's a tough league. I mean, Red Sox fans are so down on that rotation that, like, 
uh, I got accused of, of, of coming up with this on drugs. <laughs> and like, there was a lot of, lot of pushback, but, uh, I mean, there's just a lot of pitchers I like on that on that team. Tanner Houck uh, with the cutter. You know, he's dominant against righties. Uh, cutter Crawford uh, now has a 20 IVB on his fastball, uh, which makes him one of six pitchers in baseball that has 20 IVB along with Nick Bavetta. Um, and he has a 12-inch sweeper. So, like, I like cutter. I've always liked cutter. We've talked about cutter on this pod before. Um, Bayo's throwing the hard slider and stop throwing that fastball. He had a 607 slugging against his four seam fastball and he stopped throwing it. So, uh, you know, I think there's, I think there's some good stuff in coming in Boston that just got, got obscured by a lot of young pitchers trying to figure it out last year. You know, and we've got a few more bold predictions coming here in just a few minutes. I got a couple that I want to dig into from Eno's article. Uh, Nico Goodrum is a Ray, which is kind of interesting it would have been more interesting two or three years ago i think this is just the result of having a couple of injuries taylor walls of course has been hurt for a while and then jonathan aranda getting hurt late in the spring created a need for why, one more though? infielder you know, why not just say okay junior let's go what what is going on here is it just to keep junior cheaper for longer like what is happening why what does nico goodrum do like they have his walls walls is hurt i guess huh yes he's hurt and rosario maybe they don't want to play him at short they have not been playing him at short right so, so another i, I mean is, but nico good i don't know it's just one more name stacked onto a depth chart full of guys that we already sort of like for different reasons you know, i've talked a lot about richie palacios curtis mead is someone that can move around and play a few spots so I don't see there's there's a lot of playing time for Goodrum. I'm kind of curious to see who eventually gets pushed off of the roster with his arrival. Because it's going to cost someone something. I saw Austin Shenton made the opening day roster. So maybe it's a, a quick stint for him before he ends up at triple A. There, there's some weird like games people play with roster deadlines and what happens like a week after. I think that... I think there's like a little bit of like inertia where like, oh, we decided who the roster is. We made our decisions. And so like for the next week or two, at least we're set. Right. And then there are other teams that are like, ooh, um, people think that their rosters are set. And so if I can just do something for a couple of days, then maybe I can sneak someone through waivers later and keep them in my organization. And I'm looking straight at you, Farhan Zaidi, because the Giants kept three catchers. And none of them are really that good. I mean, okay, Patrick Bailey is probably a really good catcher in real life, you know, not necessarily offensively. But they they kept Tom Murphy and Joey Bart. Why? Because if they if they lose if they drop Joey Bart before if they put him on waivers before uh, um, uh, the season starts, somebody will just pick him up because you know the Rays would have. Didn't they just pull a trade for a catcher? Ben Rortvit. Ben Rortvit. Who that was in the uh in the birdie trade? Yeah, I think that was a three team trade, actually. Yeah. So uh, you know, they get uh they they got a catcher. You know the race if Joy Bart was on waivers would have would have claimed him. And I think maybe now they say, well, we got Ben Rortvit. Do we want to lose Ben Rortvit to get Joy Bart? You know what I mean? So like I swear Farhan is just like, we'll have three catchers for like three days. Yeah, I, this, this is the way organizations try to function uh, because <laughs> it's retaining as much talent as possible and, yep. and playing within every last inch of the rules to get there, right? Yeah, uh, I thought the Brewers are going to try something similar with Eric Haas, but it looks like they're, they're not doing the three catcher him. one. No, well, he's not on the roster right now anyway. That, that one was a little bit more interesting because Gary Sanchez has enough bat to be the DH. I am not playing Tom Murphy or Joey Bart at DH. Right. And I think... <laughs> or Patrick Bailey, for that matter. Well, and I think because Bailey is such a great defender, you you already have the elite glove guy. Sometimes that first backup is a all-glove, we love how this guy handles the staff sort of player. If that guy's your starter... I don't know how you justify keeping the other two. It's just hoping you have a better chance of sneaking them through waivers later. That's that's what I think that's it comes all I back can come to. Come up with, yeah. 
why do they sign Tom Murphy if the, they want to keep Joey Bart? It's, you know, Farhan's been, Far, yeah, Farhan's been crazy about catchers. He traded Mauricio Dubon for Michael Papierski, who didn't end up being a catcher or wasn't a good enough hitter. And then he just released him two weeks later. And then he lost him. And he just lost Dubon for nothing, which maybe he was planning on doing anyway. But it was like he's been kind of furiously trying to like put catchers in a system cooper hummel he claims blake sable on the on the on the on the rule five draft he keeps blake sable on the roster all year long which he was okay i guess and then he drops blake sable to the minors as soon as he can because he has now acquired this guy that's just in his organization because he rule five him. it's 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 annoying it's, it's just stockpiling as much as you can. Are you more yeah. annoyed by all of that, or are you more annoyed by Marco Luciano ah. going to AAA? Uh, I had a like fairly uh, up and down conversation with Andrew Baggerly where we were arguing our positions and we didn't agree with each other. He didn't quite convince me. Um, his stance was more like, yeah, Marco Luciano is not ready uh, with the glove or the bat. He hasn't played a lot. He deserves like a whole full year in AAA to just play every day and and play all the time and not uh, face basically the, you know, the what happens in the major leagues. Um, I guess I see that, but I just I see Marco Luciano's defense differently than other people. I guess I see Marco Luciano uh, as having nice hands. I think he has good hands. I think he throws the ball away sometimes, but I think. You know, uh, that's it's a little bit like blocking with catchers. You the guy misses it once and you're like, oh, that guy is terrible. Gary Sanchez can't catch, you know, and you look at all the numbers you're like, oh, Gary Sanchez, not that terrible. You know, the same way with Luciano. I feel like he throws a ball away. Or, ah, that guy can't be shortstop. It's like, well, he's, yeah, he threw a ball away. I don't know. Um, he has enough lateral quickness now to be a shortstop for the next five to six years, I think. And um, I don't know. I, I would just stick him in there. I think we know what Nick Ahmed is. I don't, I mean, he had a good spring, I guess. I don't know. I think the other improvements to the roster, like getting Matt Chapman, getting one more significant bat was enough of a lift where you didn't have to force it with Luciano. And I think probably to the point that Andrew Baggerly made talking to you is Luciano because of injuries has missed a lot of time, but he also struck out well over 30% of the time at AAA and in the big leagues, 35% or higher at both stops, only 32 games. You want to make sure that's ironed out. He was hitting the ball on the ground a ton too. So wasn't mm-hmm. getting to the power, was striking out way too much. And you do have some defensive concerns. Maybe you don't have as much as others. Give him a couple of months at Sacramento. See if the K rate comes down. See if the defense is consistently where you want it. And then bring him up end of April, middle of May, whenever, whenever it's appropriate based on what's going on with the big league club. You're not going to get much out of Nick Ahmed. As long as Nick Ahmed plays a good defensive shortstop, that's about as much as the Giants can ask him for. Yeah. There's a little bit of a change in organizational philosophy where the, the old Giants had had, had t- picked up old players that weren't that great defensively and tried to coach it up. Uh, these new Giants have really improved their defense. You know, with Nick Ahmed and Matt Chapman on the left side, that's a big upgrade in defense over last year so. See how that kind of filters through uh, for their pitchers, and 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 how that works if if they have enough offense. Otherwise, yeah. Two other random odds and ends before we move on to some other things. Miguel Sano made the Angels. He's starting on opening day. He's their DH today. How surprising is that? I had the, the visions uh, of that silly game I've got, uh, which might be a fun off season uh, thing to to to, uh, to play around with. Is if you could take Miguel Sano and mush him together with Nolan Shanuel, um, you would have like a maybe like a Frank Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, separately, I'm not interested in either of them. So you're not getting, you know, the middle point of all their best skills. You're taking all of their best player attributes and, and putting them together. Putting them together. Yeah, I was um, thinking like, what about Esturi Ruiz? Plus Pete Alonzo. Sure. I mean, yeah, you can <laughs> you can do all sorts of things if you're playing that game. Yeah. I actually ran into a situation where Shanuel looked kind of interesting to me. I'm in an OBP AL only league. It's a keeper league. Mm-hmm. And the corner is pretty thin in general. 
And he actually had a decent spring, popped a couple of homers. We saw him get on base at a 402 clip last year, even though he was rushed, which is pretty impressive, right? So, you know, like core skills for that particular league, mono league, sure, let it happen. He also stole a couple of bases. We talked about the Angels being an active team on the base pass. I don't know. There's just a handful of ways in deeper leagues where, where Nolan Chanuel might be a little more interesting. But the thing I want to watch with him is the quality of contact through the first few weeks of the season. Is there significant 100%. improvement from all the standing? As you might remember, the- Sam Blum wrote the story about Nolan Chanuel standing <laughs> all day long, three days a week throughout the offseason. Uh, he must have gotten an Apple Watch. Uh, the difference between the the zips projection and the bad x projection is is got to be one of the bigger ones out there the bad x projects him for seven homers and zips projects him for 18 yeah i love that that's a big difference <laughs> i love that i wouldn't i'm not going to go as far as to say that there's no stack cast and zips like i don't believe that uh i know danson zors he walk, works on it stack has been out for a while there's no way there's none in it but the, that just shows that there's a different weighting. <laughs> well, and the thing I would point back to, and this may have come up previously, is the scouting grades, right? Present game power, 30 over at Fangraphs. Future game power, 50. 50. Draw power, 45. So it's in there as far as the scouting goes. So, right. you know, we have to buy into some of that. And if you have those other core skills to fall back on, you could do a lot worse in a super deep league. And 60% uh, ground ball rate this spring. It's kind of amazing. He hit two homers. Yeah. Well, hey, wait, if, if you do damage when you lift it, you can find a way to work around that. No, 60% ground ball rate. There's no way to really defend that. Uh, last, <laughs> last interesting note uh, it's Ronel Blanco getting a chance mm-hmm. in the back of the rotation. For the Astros, while Justin Verlander's out, Verlander's absence probably isn't going to last that long. We're looking at a couple more weeks. He's trying to get stretched out to about 80, 85 pitches before he comes back. So uh, just a couple of turns for Blanco. But I, th- I think we have to be somewhat intrigued anytime the Astros have anyone breaking into their rotation they've shown us time and time again they can get a lot of mileage out of guys that maybe didn't have a lot of appeal as prospects and Blanco's a little older than most of the guys that debut for them he's 30 uh, what I'm curious is there anything in that pitch mix that intrigues you there are some pretty good results from Blanco at AAA given that he's been kind of an up and down guy for a couple of seasons now for this Astros team you know what's funny is you look at these walk rates and you they're not good, but they are not like Edward Cabrarian. Um, you know, they're sort of 10 to 11, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of 13 there, but and some 12s, but you know, that's Edward Cabrera. We're talking about like 14, 15, and 16 percent walk rates, right? Um, and yet they may have similar command. We've got 30 command put on him by fan graphs, and then location plus last year said that he located his four seam fastball with a 92 location plus that is 30 command and so uh i'm kind of amazed they must be single uh they must be using a single target with the catcher and finding i don't know miss patterns that work or uh, really working on game day uh game day ideas where like his slider location plus is 99 so maybe you know, just a, just enough sliders when he needs a strike, whatever it is, 33% strikeout rate, 7% walk rate this spring. You have my attention right now, Blanco. <laughs> I just like to be playing deep enough leagues where anybody needs to be considered in those leagues. And there's always that possibility. There's a little bit more in there. Uh, and I think Blanco is worth monitoring here in these first few turns. Let's get to some bold predictions. You wrote him up for The Athletic, theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. If you don't have a subscription already, we got to start with the team one first. You have the Pirates finding their way into the postseason. Defend yourself, sir. (laughs) Uh, I went with a bullet point list, but there's a lot of stuff that I like about this team. It's just, um, you know, we've talked about Hayes uh, lifting the ball finally. Um, we've talked about, um, O'Neill Cruz. O'Neill Cruz has like three of the top or four of the top 15, uh, tracked batted ball X velocities this spring. So he is just really murdering the ball. I know he's got some strikeout rate and platoon issues. Um, you know, some say he's not a great defender, but with Hayes next to him, I feel like that's a little bit mitigated. 
Um, I didn't even put this on the list, but Jared Triolo is a big line drive guy. Uh, I think he's he's got like a 30% line drive rate in the minors in AAA and in and, and, and the big leagues. Um, and that's like if he, you know, it's really hard to kind of keep your balls in the line drive rates, but it lines up with his good um, hit tool grades. Uh, Jack Suwinski struck out 20% of the time this spring. That's like the only thing he doesn't do well. Uh, Jared Jones was a top 10 spring plus plus uh, string stuff plus guy, and he made the roster. Uh, I even like, but don't love. I, I'm not going to say this is like a big bullet point, but I like the idea of spending in the sort of six to eight million dollar range, um, you know, on the on the free agent market to get guys like Martin Perez and Marco Gonzalez and, you know, just Eric, even Eric Lauer, because they won't block your guys if they come up. If Quinn Priester is, ex- is just exploding onto the scene, you're going to bring them up. Jared Jones, they didn't block Jared Jones, right? Um, Jared Jones made the roster. So just getting like getting to replacement level in some of those places, I think is a big deal. Um, so I just, I, I, I see a team that's better, you know, in a lot of ways. And what they are in is also in this interesting spot that, they're taking guys who used to be uh, like if you're a bad team, you try these guys as starters for as long as you can. So Luis Ortiz and, and Ryan Contreras, those are guys that if you're a bad team, you're just like, there are starters. They're going to be bad. We're going to be bad. It's fine. When you see a team that's in this sort of area, take those guys and put them in the bullpen. That means a couple of things. It means they've got something else better coming. Paul Skeens, Jared Jones. But it also means, hey, we're trying to compete now. And Ronzi, you can't keep your fastball shape or velocity all season. So I can't I can't put you in. Uh, you're in the bullpen. And maybe he will be a great reliever because maybe he can keep that velo up as a reliever. Uh, and Luis Ortiz, you can't command it enough. And you have excellent stuff. Maybe it'll work better in the bullpen. So there's just, um, you know, they're doing the things, they have the things, and they're doing the things that, like, teams that are maturing do. And I just wanted to point out, last year, uh, the Diamondbacks and the Rangers, too? or At least the Diamondbacks were, were projected for the same amount of wins as the Pirates are projected for right now. Yeah, the Orioles were the other team. Orioles, that's it. 78 wins was their projection, and the Pirates sitting there at 77. I think the interesting thing when you look at the NL Central, is that the win total projection for the Cardinals, who Fangrass has at 83.4, and the Pirates at 77.5, it's less than six wins, top to bottom. And, and the most of their divisions, bigger than that. Right, and most of their divisions, there's a gap of six wins between first and second because the Braves, the Phillies, the Phillies are a really good team, projected mm-hmm. for, geez, it's like 13 fewer wins than the Braves. The Diamondbacks, a good team, projected for almost 10 fewer wins than the Dodgers. Like That's pretty surprising, right? So mm-hmm. that's how tight the NL Central is in particular. Even the AL Central is not clustered quite like that. It's you know six wins between the Twins and the Tigers. So you have the Twins, Guardians, and Tigers, more of a three-team race. Maybe the Royals can get in there. They're about nine games behind the Twins in the projection. And then the White Sox are in bad team land where they're just it's just not happening. Like we're grouping all the teams in the league and their probabilities of making the playoffs. The White Sox, the A's, the Nationals, and the Rockies would be the four teams clearly in the bottom tier, right? And I'm just taking, yeah, I'm taking the Pirates out of that. You know, right. the Pirates aren't part Pirates of that. In with the they're, Reds. they're in the long shot tier. Like they, they're they're like Reds, like a, a Royals, long shot the Tigers. You know, right? Yeah, that's fair. I, yeah. I think it's also going to hinge on what they do with the cluster of prospects they have that are likely all going to be at double A to start the year. Uh, Bubba Chandler, who had a late season promotion to Altoona last year, Anthony Solomedo, uh, and Thomas Harrington, who actually has a, a rotator cuff strain, so he's going to be yeah. shut down for a few weeks. But some combination of those guys could make an impact later in the year as well, um, aside from you know, Skeens and Jones and the the names that we know are, are closer to contributing. So they do have a lot of interesting depth within that group of prospects that could uh, round up a little bit on that pitching. And I do think the position player core is slightly overlooked. Brian Reynolds is one of the most underrated players in the league right now. And oatmeal with honey. 
<laughs> oatmeal with honey right just just inside that top 100 so he couldn't be <laughs> captain of the oatmeal team and it's not this year but you're right you have a potential star and cruise the growth of Hayes. like you you can tell yourself a story i think that's actually a fun bold prediction that is bold enough but is like kind of realistic when you start to break it down like that so that's why i wanted to really uh, dig into that one some some one of these teams if i could make a less bold prediction it would be that one of the reds pirates tigers and royals like makes the postseason yeah that's way less bold but it's basically i just picked the pirates i did a thing about the royals too um where it's just like they these are the types of teams where things gel a little bit faster than you think i don't like to go negative on opening day but who takes last in the nl central if you have the pirates getting a wild card uh -huh. <laughs> don't don't even <laughs> don't, don't even let's, do this to barrel just... man I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it. Don't do it to Barrel Man, man. He, he deserves better. I won't say it out loud, but I'm thinking it. I'm so disappointed in you right now. <laughs> Fine. Let's talk about something we both like. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> Sean Murphy. Yeah. The bold prediction that Sean Murphy will be the best catcher in baseball. I love yeah, this call. Gotta... I love it. I think he's gonna play more than he did last year, and that's. Like you already have the core skills, both as a hitter and as a defensive catcher, to be the position leader in war. I think he's absolutely capable of the capable of that if the playing time jumps up closer to the upper echelon of catchers again. Yeah, I mean, playing time is is iffy because they have a, a really really good backup, and that's what happened last year. Was I think there were some injuries. And then people said the Georgia Heat, which ah, I don't know, dude. <laughs> I, think, I think most baseball players who've spent their entire lives every summer out in the heat playing baseball are not bothered by the heat. I, that's sort of my guess. But the injury one I get, and that could happen anytime. It happens to catchers. And so I think a lot of, in terms of like recency bias, or if you're a Braves fan, you might remember a lot of late last season when he was almost benched for TDA, right? Like there were, he was, Traz Darno was playing more than Sean Murphy was. Um, yeah, but, but TDA had a 685 OPS last season. It was the second time in the last three seasons he's been under 700. And he's 35 with a ton of injuries, including multiple concussions on his resume. He's at the point in his career, you don't want to push him into the lineup any more than you have to. He's a 250 plate appearance player if not a little yeah. less at this stage on that team, especially. Yeah. And then just the core skills for uh, Sean Murphy are great. And I introduced the, a stat that Ben Clemens put together, which um, has some whimsy to it. It's womps per whiff. Um, anybody who uh, listens to Raising Barrels knows about barrels. And he put it, uh, he put barrels up against swinging strikes. It's, it's smart. And it apparently is more predictive than WRC plus. Um, which is interesting because Sean Murphy still had a 129 WRC plus last year and was a four win player. So, you know, he was really good last year and yet he was top 10 in this womps per whiff thing. So, you know, you're talking about a guy who barreled at 16% of the time. We just said Will Smith was a really good player and Sean Murphy does everything Will Smith does. And in, in a lot of places better, you know? So, um, you know, I think that that Sean Murphy is sort of a, a ascendant. This another thing with last year is it was his first year with the new team. You know, this year I think he's going to be an unquestioned leader in that in that uh, clubhouse and on that team because the catcher is a is a is a normal place to look, and he is one of the most fastidious everyday planner types. Like he's he works really hard at the calling, uh, the framing, the, all that bit, and yet is also just a really really excellent hitter. So I, I could see all this coming together this year. Okay, I like that call. There's one more I want to talk about. There's 10 in the article, but we'll we'll cap it at three for the purposes of the show. Vlad Jr. is the AL MVP. And you wrote this, like this wouldn't have been bold in the past, but I think it has become bold over time. I think the the ceiling expectations for Vlad Jr. have come down a little bit. I think because he had two seasons since 2021 where he didn't play on that MVP level. People are now penciling him in as a very good hitter, 
but one that won't be in the running for an award like that. So why will 2024 be different? Because I think there's the version of Vlad Jr. that the projections will sell you based on his age and past performance. That is fantastic. And then there's just the more recent version of what we've seen, which is 26, 32 homers the last two seasons, 264, 274 average, you know, good counting stats, but not necessarily that that superstar sort of level. Yeah, the 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 projection thing was interesting. So I reached out to Derek Cardi and said, you know, like, can you tell me what you projected him, how many homers you projected him for for the last few years? <laughs> and and I was like, I'm not, I'm not like Derek. I'm not gonna. I love you. I love the bat. I'm not, I'm not making fun of the bat. Like I just, this is an interesting one because he he keeps getting projected for more homers than he hits, right? So uh, in 2022, it projected him for 42 homers, and he hit 32. And then it comes off of that, and it projects him for 35 homers the next year, and he hits 26. Hmm. So like his projections, like no, no, he's gonna he's gonna do this, he's gonna do this, <laughs> and and then what Vlad does is like no, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the so I think it is fair to kind of I think that's what the market is doing. I mean, like to be to be honest, like if you look at at uh, NFC or ADP. You know, if you look at where he's being drafted and stuff, like he usually is a value where he's drafted according to projections. But the, I think the market is saying, hey, yeah, 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 you fooled me twice. You know, I'm not going to do this again. Um, the one thing that under the hood that has actually changed is his launch angle. He is he has just slowly pushed his launch angle up over time, and um, the best period for launching the ball in his career has been this spring plus the last two or three months of last season. And that's a big part of it. I mean, we just, we've just we been staring at Vlad Guerrero saying, yeah, you can hit the ball 118. Got it. Can you hit the ball in the air? And I see this happening a little bit from the uh, uh, the home run derby. Remember, Soto, Soto hits the ball on the ground a lot. Soto hits like 70% of his pulled balls on the ground. Um, and, and so... He went to the the home run derby, and this is I'm I, hey I'm wandering into narrative. This I, I've wandered past the data. I'm into narrative, <laughs> but Soto like went to the home run derby and started lifting it, and had one of his better power seasons, power half seasons after the home run derby that year. I could see something a little bit because I was watching Vlad in the home run derby and be like, "You're telling me this guy can't launch the ball? <laughs> I think he has the record for either number of homers in an entire derby or a number of homers in a round." Either way, yeah, when you watch it, you you know that there is a, and I realize it's like more like BP, of course, being in the home right, run right, derby, right. but there is a ability to repeatedly launch the ball in the way you want him to. So how well does that translate to how he's pitched in games and how much of it is adjusting and not necessarily hitting pitches he can hit? That's been my my open-ended question with Vlad for the last two seasons is, is he getting to pitches that, yes, he can hit and hit the opposite way for a single instead of possibly working the count a little bit more and getting into a situation where he's going to get something he's going to lift and drive? And yeah, is that the actual core problem, or is it attack angle and swing or a combination of both? Like You could try right. even one of those things and get a better result. And you'll get both answers. Uh, you'll get both answers from different people. Like if you talk to a hitting coach, they will talk about a attack angle probably for him. Um, but you know, if you just look at what he can do, and if you look at what he did in that in that home run derby, he has a nitro zone up and in, and uh, that's where he can lift the ball best. And so it could be a, just a question of approach. Maybe just spit on more pitches that are low and in the zone, and risk getting into two strike counts in order to get another mistake up and in. You know, I was looking at um, at like improbable pitches for the for the craft with with Nick, um, and you know, I saw Devin Williams has thrown three high and tight super changeups, whatever that thing is, screwballs to right. He threw three high and tight airbenders to righties last year. None of all of them were set up low and away. Hmm. So if you're Vladdy facing, you know, you're basically waiting for mistakes that are up. You know, and I think he has such a good hit tool that he says, well, they're really trying to throw me down. They're really trying to throw me low and away and down because they know my nitro zone is up. Well, 
maybe risk a couple called strikes to get another chance at a ball that's up more than the pitcher wants. You know, maybe that's easier to change than it is to change his entire attack angle. Attack angle to me is a little bit like ch- trying to change a pitcher's slot. You know, it's going to take hard work. And it, you you swung that way for a while. <laughs> you know, uh, and you've had success. You like nearly won an MVP that way. <laughs> you know, so you know if it if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So maybe you could just kind of shave away at the approach and just be like, hey, just wait a little bit more for that pitch up. Yeah, and we're still talking about a guy who's twenty five. He turned twenty five yeah. twelve days ago. So there could be three or four seasons that look a lot more like that first peak season in 2021. That's entirely possible for Vlad Jr. So that's a fun pick as well. And I think, uh, as you wrote, the focus is on the Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, like the, the guys that have a little more year-to-year consistency. That's where most people's eyes are are fixed when we're, we're looking yeah, the for odds, possible MVP winners. He's not a top five odds guy. And in fact, I looked at places where he wasn't a top 10 odds guy for American League MVP. Yeah, so you want... Uh, My last year pick for happen. AL MVP was Corey Seager, second place. He's he's you were right by five. process. Yeah. And if you if you read these, the process is often just because I want them to be educational in some way and informative and, and entertaining. Um, the process is to is to try to highlight different stats, you know, and try to and I just basically troll through different leaderboards and find interesting names and then make a bold prediction. You know, like Christopher Morell is top 50 in Seeger. That's surprising. And he's also, you know, fifth best in uh, in max exit velocity among, you know, 25 and unders. Well, that's a pretty good combo. Uh, let me just make him an all-star, you know, boom, bold prediction. All he has to do is hit enough to stay in the lineup despite his defense or yeah, get exactly. better defensively <laughs> somewhere. And There's a couple a ways, right? Way. Either yeah. he gets a little bit better defensively or he hits so much that they're just like, ah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. We'll just let yeah. it happen. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, check out Eno's bold predictions piece up now at the Athletic. You know, let's talk about the biggest draft, like the the one that your whole season kind of revolves around just because of what is at stake in it. You're in the NFBC main event uh, this year. Uh, I'm not playing in it. I'm not playing in the equivalent auction this year either. Simple reason, money is tight. <laughs> That's that's the whole story for me. I but. have a co-manager partially because money is it's, it's a tough one. It's like, a, what is it, like a $1,400 entry or something? You know, It's like seventeen fifty, I think, is what the final number was. 1500 yeah, for the big auction. Wanna, and I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it out loud. <laughs> I'm too much of a control freak for the auction, especially to share the auction. Mm. And I'm better at auctions than snakes. So anyway, those those are my reasons. I'm in, I'm in some smaller stuff, but nothing like that this year. But what I've noticed over the years, I played in the NFBC main event for several years back in the Rotowire days, and usually had a co-manager to do it too. Then, and it it certainly it certainly helps to have the extra set of eyes, given how important every decision is, making sure you don't miss on lineup changes, you know, going through the process, making sure you feel really good about the strategy, uh, having that extra voice that you trust, especially if you get into a situation where. There's a run on something. Your, your plan starts to unravel. It's a little easier to untangle it with another sharp mind working with you. So highly recommend co-managers once you're you're into the high stakes world. Now, these drafts are different. Uh, the biggest thing up top that you'll see if you compare NFBC main event ADPs to the rest of the NFBC's events, and there's a lot of different league sizes and formats, you're going to see starting pitching early on get pushed up a lot. And this year in particular, we also saw relievers get jumped up a lot. And I think it's a little bit jarring if you haven't played in it before and you don't really expect it because you're seeing names that are going a half round or a round or even more than that above their usual recent spots. So I'm just curious, as you've played in this for a couple of years now, how much do you tailor your strategy to knowing that's coming? Like, Do you lean into it and say, it's okay, we're going to build a strategy around it? Or do you say, I think the group doing this might be as sharp as they are, leaving an advantage to playing it a little bit differently and not being as aggressive with pitching for this particular contest? Yeah, we made a plan. Basically, it was close to a hard punt in, of starting pitchers. 
because we thought those starting pitchers had so much inflation and that there were so many questions after the top five. I think it's really uh, there's a top five starting pitchers and then, then the questions start. I mean, I have Yamamoto in my top 10 and you're going to tell me there's no questions there. You know what I mean? Like Tyler Glass knows, like, I think I have 10th or 11th, like the questions start quickly. And so, you know, we thought let's do, uh, so we made a plan together. Um, and, uh, it was, it was to do one starting pitcher in the first 12 rounds. That was the plan. Um, every plan was it, how's it go? Every plan is good to get punched in the mouth. Yeah, I think that's a Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we actually, it was a little bit different. Uh, I don't know what the what the expression is, but um, George Kirby fell in our laps. Yeah, and I don't know if there's an expression for that. It's just a thing that happens. We couldn't, we were we picked five in the first round. We didn't expect Kirby to be there coming back. So we were going to take Rafael Devers. Um, and so we knew we had the choice between Betts and Julio Rodriguez uh Julio was taken before us so we took bets we took bets over Carroll um just felt like bets was super super safe and would allow us some positional flexibility now with short second and outfield um that might be fun and might be useful to us down in the draft later and so we were expecting to take Devers on the way back we took Kirby instead and then there was the question do we change what we're going to do and just have Kirby bear only pitch or do we take this unexpected boon and add to it, you know, take a strength and add to it. And what we ended up doing was uh, taking Joe Ryan in the fourth um, to hopefully give us a good number two. Um, and then sticking with the plan after that. Mm. So we got Betts and Simeon along with Kirby Hader and Ryan, the first five that actually uh, looks like a pretty, milk toast approach <laughs> for the main event don't you think like yeah two hitters two pitchers and a closer it, it's it's a pretty common start i think yeah it wasn't com. what we did next was not common so this and, is what we did and that, next and that's the fun part like this is where we were like this is what we're gonna do that's different than everybody else and nobody else did what we did we took six straight bats and we took eight of the next nine were bats hmm. so we went William Contreras, Xander Bogart, Zach Geloff, Cabrian Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Chaz McCormick, Aaron Savali, Reese Hoskins, Tyler O'Neill. And what we did was we basically said, you know, we think the blob begins earlier than you do. You know, people are taking these Merrill Kellys and Shane Bieber's and Carlos Rodones and Justin Steele's. And we're like, those are good pitchers, but we are creating a position player core that is across all of our positions and we think won't we won't touch them all year we want to get as many of those bats we want to have a position player core of 10 position players we don't touch and then we'll be working the wire hard around that 10 and fitting guys in and we want to leave some openings because last year we wanted to bid on yanir diaz but we couldn't because we had two good catchers so the way that we do this, we set this up so that we have basically one at every position that we're really strong about and we're flexible when it comes to what comes down the pipe. Um, and uh, then, of course, when you do that, you create the need for the yellow brick road. Mm -hmm. And on NFC, pitchers are yellow. So I, I, I love this because so we did this thing and I don't know if people notice in the room or they're just doing their own thing or whatever. Guess what our next picks were? Kenta Maeda, Louis Varlin, Seth Lugo, Trevor Rogers, Shane Boz, Ty France, Tanner Houck, Reynaldo Lopez, Daniel Hudson, Trevor McGill, Edward Cabrera, and Brock Stewart. We just went yellow. And what we're trying to do there is we're trying to stay out of streamers. We think all of these players are players you want to have on your roster as options. You might put them on your bench or you might put them in your lineup, but you're not going to drop them totally. Uh, Daniel Hudson's, the, we just bought him for the one win. We just we just bought him for one win. He's going to be our dropper. <laughs> That's all we did was Daniel Hudson, give us a win. Thank you. Bye. Um, because we could do that in retrospect. Daniel Hudson got a win in Seoul. And in the NFC, you get credit for that, which is kind of crazy. But we bought that win. We're 10th uh, we're overall, by the way. Hey. 
because we had <laughs> Betts and Bogarts and Daniel Hudson. So <laughs> we're gonna win it, baby. But the idea was that these all these pitchers are also all good options for week one. So for week one, we have seven starters. And we have Brock Stewart and Josh Hader, or, or Trevor McGill and, and Josh Hader. That's and we knew we had seven good starts for week one. Week two, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe Ryan is particularly interesting because he fits into that cluster of the pitchers just go earlier in this particular event. Right, you're talking about a guy that carried an ADP that was mostly around pick 90 for the first five months of draft season. Had a little bit of a bump in the second half of March into the 80 range, and then went at pick 65 in the mains, like just a. And that's exactly right where there. we got him, 65. Yeah, yeah, we saw it. We saw it with closers. So I mentioned Evan Phillips was probably the biggest riser among closers, along with Andres Munoz. I think that was accelerated further by the injuries to. Devin Williams, Joanne Duran, uh, Jordan Romano, mm-hmm. all of that created this extra push that there was going to be a lift anyway, but instead of being 20 picks, it was a lot more than that even compared to what we saw a month or so ago for those guys. Yeah, you know, one thing that I'm proud of uh, is that even if we had like a sort of milk toast could have been anybody's board top, we did something uh, that nobody else did and that allowed us, you know, when we were doing the Yellow Brick Road, we were like, oh, yeah, Louis Varland, yeah, so yeah, Trevor Raj. And we did a little of that um, that yo-yo that I've been talking about where it's you pair Louis Varland with Kenta Maeda. Mm-hmm. You know, you pair Seth Lugo with Shane Boz. You know, so we were kind of like pair floor with ceiling, floor ceiling, floor ceiling, floor ceiling. And it was really fun in that in that moment. Aaron Savali was the one where I was like, pounding the table a little bit. We cannot let Aaron Zavali go past us, you know? Um, and uh, it was like him and Ryan Pepio were right there. And and then, so Savali, Hoskins, O'Neal was a, a big uh, influence from my side where I was like, I want those 30 homers from Hoskins. You know, I want to take a shot at, at a healthy O'Neal. He's not that healthy now. And my co- my my co-manager was like, he's not healthy now. And I'm like, he's still in the lineup at DH, baby. That's different. <laughs> he's not on the IL. So anyway, oh. um, you know, yeah, with the, with the when your sheet in terms of the ADP risers, you'll see a, a real obvious um you know, collection of guys um uh, that are are just the closers all go up around because the closers are hurt. Uh, but there's some other interesting ones like, you know, O'Neill Cruz uh, jumped a whole round, mm-hmm. um, you know, when the main started coming up. Um, and uh, I think that's just, you know, I think there's a little bit of the like, well, I, I'm not going to take Ellie. That's a bad deal. I'll take O'Neill later, you know. Um, uh, and then, you know, Blake Snell uh, went up a, a whole round. I just lack of uncertainty you know also the difference between Blake Snell signing in New York versus signing in San Francisco I think is probably worth about a round yeah um you know White Langford went up uh almost three rounds because he made the team um so you know, Dylan Cease went up do you think that Dylan Cease going from the White Sox to the Padres should have gone up a round and a half yeah I think so I mean, it's a it's a good More part wins. and a better team. Yeah, higher yeah. higher win probability, and I just think a, a safer floor on the ratios. Even though we know with the walks, the you know, whip could be a little bit of a problem for Dylan Cease, but I, I agree with that kind of bump on him. And the guys that were dropping, right? You have pitching coming up, you know, which which hitters come down? Uh, old and boring, typically. Paul Goldschmidt was down like twenty picks in the mains compared to where he was going. I thought. That was a pretty good opportunity um, for anybody that was looking at him. But then Kyle Schwarber was another big faller that I just can't get on board with, man. I just haven't been building teams with Schwarber in them. He is hard. He's an O for draft season player for me. I think I've built 12 teams this year and he's not on any of them. It's one of those things where a projection system is just going to look at the value of the player and they're not going to look at how difficult they are to build around. You know, Kyle Schwarber is a great punt batting average guy. I mean, you could almost decide to do the punt batting average because you know 
that opens up Kyle Schwarber for you. And it opens up a bunch of players, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I, like as much as I'm, I, the one reason I'm proud of this main event for us is that we tried something that is that is basically punting. And I think that the nice thing about punting is it it's so hard to be good at everything that punting allows you to gain advantages in other places. It's just so hard to do when you're in the room. Like you've been wired to try and build a nice, well-rounded team. And then you're like, nope, I'm just going to build a team that has a 225 batting average. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, how am I going to win with this? Well, so, yeah. The, the overall component, any contest with an overall prize, like com- completely committing to a punt is basically saying i'm could i win probably not thousand dollars like if i had a 20 batting average i don't i mean you're but you have to crush everything else and i think that puts a lot of pressure on everything else going right that a lot of people are unwilling to take that risk i think it's more of the which category am i going to be 50 or 60 percentile in and then which ones are going to be my more dominant ones and that's where steals or saves becomes the one that you might be a little lighter and say well i know i'm lighter in that category coming out of the draft I'll take my shots in early season fab. If I don't find the category by a certain point in the season, then I'll just be content and not continue pushing resources at it. Right. There's a few ways you can soft punt or, or just mm-hmm. plan to be weaker in a category without giving it away. Yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the wording that I'm was, was looking for. I was going to say soft punt. And I think the nice thing about soft punt is we, we had this uh, during COVID, we had this, uh, we had this competition. What was it called? The greatest team of all time or whatever. They, Project Goat. Project Goat. That's right. And the the person that won it uh, and the people that were near this to the top, um, I forget wh- who the pitcher was. It was some reliever um, that got like 12 or 15 wins along with like 25 saves. Mm-hmm. And it was not the most, it was like kind of an innocuous season i mean it's not it wasn't one that you're like oh that's one for the ages but all the winners had him and the reason was that was their only closer and in an overall and so this is important for our current contest that we have uh it's on the discord but you know it's it's shut down now but like a lot of you guys joined it i did a soft punt uh in a similar way for that one because we have what do we have like 1200 people playing it yeah a lot of entries if you're up against 1,200 people, a full punt means you get a zero in that category. But a soft punt could mean 300. It could mean all those points of, of, of all the people that did the hard punt. Mm-hmm. So my soft punt strategy in that one was James MacArthur. <laughs> I had one reliever. I spent $1 on relief. And I just want, if James MacArthur can get me five saves... Heck, if he can get me two, I'm going to jump above. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if he can get me two, I'm going to jump above a lot of people. So I think the soft punt is the way to go. You get off of the ground of, of the full punt, you know? And so in this one, the soft punt was uh, second catcher. Patrick Bailey is our second catcher. I got him in the third to last round. Uh, our soft punt is starting pitching, really, honestly. Like, because we have those two at the top, and then we waited forever. Um, and our soft punt is a uh, second reliever uh, because we have uh, Tyler Megill and Brock Stewart. And it's just like, those were like waiver wire pickup type players. You know, it's like who you might've picked up in week one. And the, one of the reasons I like that one a lot is I feel good about Josh Hader. And then I feel like I can get another closer on the wire. If you give me six months, you know, hopefully two months or something, you know, <laughs> maybe even, mcgill or stewart you know so like you know i i think you need to i i think you do need to find places where you're going to soft punt and those were the places we identified also i would say uh corner infield uh is a soft punt for us uh although ty france we've got him jd davis and ty france are like corner infield util we feel like if somebody popped up on the wire this week we could pick him up Hmm. you know what i mean like we could it wouldn't matter. We'd fit him somewhere. Even if it's like Yiner Diaz and we want to keep Patrick Bailey, we could put him at Util for a little bit and decide later, you know? Yeah. Having that roster flexibility built in is super helpful because you don't know where the best pickups are going to come from. 
Yeah. You know, this is the best hitter. If, if I can't fit that hitter in, someone else is probably going to get them because I'm not going to bid enough or I'm going to bid up and then I got to have someone who's too good on the bench. That's not a situation you want either. Um, I did play an online championship where I had to think, like, okay, how do I build this team in a way that differentiates itself from the pool? I did it really early. I did the thing where I waited on pitching too, but I decided to go with Austin Riley and Raphael Devers in rounds <laughs> two and three. It was a combination that I didn't expect to draft. Someone there is cursing her name. Somebody who wanted a good third baseman is cursing her name. But I thought about it. I said, you know, of all the teams that are in this contest, like who else put those two guys together? You very yeah. rarely <laughs> take two corners in the first three picks and two two with the same eligibility. I mean, that's pretty Keith unusual. Keith Riley for MVP. I, the problem with MVPs on those teams, unless you do what Acuna just did, it's just like you get overshadowed by the other guys in that lineup. That's why it's so hard to pick a Braves player or a Dodgers player to win the MVP. Mm-hmm. That's that's the problem I have in trying to decide on who it's going to be. But right. Austin Riley, I've, I've, I've noticed all draft season for as early as he goes and as good as he is, he doesn't get discussed all that much. But uh, yeah, we'll dig into some more Strategy related things, of course, at various points and the early part of the season, as we've said for a few weeks, a very difficult time to talk about baseball only because (laughs) you're looking at tiny sample sizes. So we'll talk about what matters in those samples next week, what actually moves the needle in these early days of the season. We have regular predictions, the non-bold variety coming on Friday on the live stream with Trevor May, one o'clock Eastern on our YouTube page. Change ups, change ups and change ups, which are fading a little bit. They're not as popular as they used to be. And they are fading. They're usually fading, literally. But I still love changeups. A really good changeup. I still enjoy it. So, so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So we got some nice, nice clips lined up for the live stream on Friday. But that's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. Enjoy opening day. We're back with you Friday. Thanks for listening.